What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you happen to be new here, then hello, my name is Erica and it is lovely to have you. Please get comfortable, take a seat, because today you have joined us for a book review of this lovely shiny thing sitting behind me, titled Psyche and Eros by Luna McNamara. Now today I will not be doing this alone, okay? I have invited on one of my favorite booktubers uh, ever, right? Not to be too much of a fangirl, but I am literally obsessed with this channel because I trust this guest when it comes to reviewing books outside of the Greek mythology realm, even within, but I mostly go to this channel because I want to see what all of the pop culture books are, you know, if they're worth it. And let me tell you, this reviewer really does not hold back. This reviewer is always up for a conversation, is always up for a debate, is always up for being honest and open with their followers about what they enjoyed, what they didn't enjoy, what you'll like if you like this thing. Oh, I just, I've loved the content for such a while. So to collaborate with this person is unbelievably exciting. So please give a warm welcome to the incredible Willow of the YouTube channel Books and Bow. Now Books and Bow is not only a YouTube channel, it's also a blog where Willow does lots of reviews of, I mean, literally every kind of genre, as long as it's in the fiction realm. So you guys can find all of those links in the description below. But today we're here to talk about Eros and Psyche. So before we can actually dive into, uh, you know, the book itself and what McNamara has done with this myth, uh, which I have discussed on the channel before, I'm pretty sure I will link the video below. Maybe I deleted that video now. It was one of my first videos, um, actually. So I'm wondering, Willow, did you know the myth of Eros and Psyche before going into this book? Or was seeing the title and knowing it was Greek mythology just kind of, you know, that was like the selling point for the book or was it, you know, you knowing the myth and wanting to see what McNamara had done with it? No, I knew nothing. Honestly, you see the cover and you go Greek. <laughs> this is like a Greek mythology thing. And I had heard the name Eros before and I knew what a psyche was. And I was like, okay, what is this? And then that was it. And I thought, okay, lots of good reviews. Although I have to admit, like looking at the back, there are a lot of names that are quoted, you know, snippets, blah, blah, blah. Names I have either never read or weren't even familiar with. And that took me by surprise because usually when you pick up a book that's within a field or a genre, you recognize the names that are related to it. Like I thought that the quotes on here would be Jennifer Saint, Natalie Haynes, Costanza Cassati, whatever. No. And I was like, that's curious. So no, I didn't know anything about the myth. But obviously I had to pick it up because it's within a field that I've become gradually obsessed with. You know what? That's a really good point though, because I noticed that as well, because I'm always looking for those buzz names or if not yeah. them, like Liv will sometimes, who does Myths Baby, she'll give a quote for books mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever happens to be. So I always look for like, who do I know? Who do I trust kind of a thing? And yeah. I was going to get this book anyways, but I was surprised by that. I was like, oh, there was no yeah. one that I would have been like, ah, okay, I trust them. And so I trust this book that exactly. had their quote on the book. Yeah, it's weird because it publishing to a degree, and that includes us, like the fans, the reviewers, the influencers, whatever, it is a pretty closed network to a point. You get to know certain names and you get to rely on those names. And when you see a bunch of stuff, like one of the quotes is the guy who wrote Wicked, the, the book. And I was like, yeah, Gregory Maguire. I mean, I've seen Wicked. But his quote on the back of here, just like, why him? Where, what was the choice there? Like, publicity people, what was, why him? You know, I wonder why if maybe like Luna was like, oh, I really want these people to read my book because I love their books, maybe. Sure. Instead of going through like, okay, well, since we know Jennifer Saint has three books out that are huge hitters, we'll go with her or, you know, yeah. whatever it is. Maybe it was like a, Maybe I'm giving too much credit. I have no idea. But maybe it was like a love project more so thing being like, I want them to read it or I love them and I love them. I mean, work. I can imagine being in that, in that situation. Like if I was an author, I get a book out and they go, okay, which authors do you want to read this? And I'm going to go, well, Kazuo Ishiguro, please. <laughs> I need to know what he thinks. So it could have been that easily. She could have gone, I love Wicked. I want to know what the author of Wicked thinks of my book. Like that would make sense. Yeah. So there are loads of characters, though, in this book. So you didn't know the myth anyways, but mm -hmm. there are loads of characters that pop up. Yeah. So was there an anchor? There is, but I'm phrasing this like a question. Was there an anchor for you that you came across that you were like, 
okay, you're familiar. I know your story that, you know, just in case somebody else is watching this that doesn't know Eros and Psyche either, that's like, am I going to go into this blind? Like, what does Willow think? Is there someone that, you know, you could actually anchor yourself to? Like, it was almost everyone except Psyche and Eros. Like, once you start reading the book a few chapters in, the names that come up are very famous within the world of Greek mythology. Like if you've read any books, again, authors we've already mentioned, like Natalie Haynes, Jennifer Saint, or if you've ever gone to see Burnt City, which is incredible, these names pop up again and again. So like Clytemnestra pops up pretty early on and she's there with Electra. And I think Electra's like five or something. And therefore you've also got Agamemnon. And so you know that like the Trojan War is going to brew in the background in some way. And then later on, there are other people that are very recognizable that you do meet. And some of them really took me by surprise. Like, I don't know if you're going to want to cut this bit out, but I was shocked when Medusa suddenly appeared in the underworld. That freaked me out. I am not that cutting this out because I did want to talk about Medusa. <laughs> so tell me all your feelings. Well, I just didn't know how that, especially after reading Stone Blind, I was very suddenly the i think that book stone blind helped i i like to think it helped i have no frame of reference for this but i like the idea that stone blind helped reframe the narrative and the attitude towards this monster right and so suddenly to have medusa as this wise but undeniably and righteously angry person who happens to be a hades tour guide in this book was very very strange but i have to admit it was one of my favorite parts in terms of the quality of the writing and the the language like when medusa talks it felt a little bit disjointed because medusa comes in and she starts giving her argument for why she herself is in fact not a monster and in fact perseus is a monster etc cetera, etc cetera. and and i do want to ask you about this because i have a feeling well, you'll definitely know. And I'm in this book, Perseus is Psyche's grandfather. And I'm not sure, based on other reviews and things people said on Goodreads, I don't think that's accurate. Right. <laughs> no, it's but, not. So there's a lot of, I'll get into this in a bit later. There's a yeah. lot of liberties taken in yeah, order so to thought. ground this myth in something that's familiar. Right. And the, the familiar thing isn't just this string of characters that you're probably going to be familiar with. It's also the Trojan War, which I think my most negative comment about this book was that the Trojan War felt as though it was shoehorned into this because it just has to be there. People know it, people expect it, and it felt like it didn't have to be there. But, okay, another bit, I don't know if you're going to want to include this, but one of the most famous things that happens in the Trojan War, from my perspective, as someone who knows all of this stuff purely based on the books of Madeline Miller, Jennifer Saint, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is how the Trojan War kicks off and the fact that Ag Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter for a fair wind, right? That happens in here. And I, I'll tell you what, I skimmed through that chapter because I know how it goes. And I was like, are we sure we need to include that moment from a different character's perspective? Because let's see, it happens in Electra because it's Electra's sister who is sacrificed. Then it happens in Clytemnestra. And I cried because that's my favorite book ever now. It's not, but it's up there. It's amazing. I love Clytemnestra. And I read it in that and I cried. Then I went to see Burnt City and you see it happen in the play Burnt City. Uh, if people don't know what that is, Google it. It's the most beautiful, wonderful thing that's ever happened to theatre. And I'm not exaggerating. And then when I read it in this, I was like, now we get to see the exact same thing, a really tragic event from a different character's perspective, a character that I didn't know until this book came along. And so it all felt very shoehorned together. I couldn't agree with that more, especially with that scene. I felt like the death of Vijnaya, I literally was like, why is this here? If you yeah. want to set this during the Trojan War, I have lots of very strong opinions about the timeline of this book about when it's set about where it's set but just before getting into all that like if you want to set it during the trojan war fine pitch me that make it work 
But why we needed to include that scene that, as you said, like now we're all really familiar with it. We all know, at least all of us in this genre know this. This yeah. book is Psyche and Eros's story, not mm-hmm. Iphigenia's story or not anyone close to her story. So why is it that that had to be in there at all? Mm-hmm. Like the idea that Psyche and Iphigenia are cousins in this book is also just not true. Like that was just put in there in order for the Trojan War stuff to work. Yeah, it's it's very strange that you're writing a book that's within a genre that famously has gotten busier and busier and more and more popular. And we expect more and more of these usually very, very good, usually feminist retellings of these Greek myths and legends. Would you th- would you not think, should I really include this scene yet again? Or do you feel like I have to include it because it's famous and recognized? It's a really weird thing. I don't know. It's like it's like if you were writing a fantasy book and you, you feel the need, do I have to put dragons in it? It's kind of like that. But it's even more specific because it's a specific scene about specific people that has been told from different angles, from different points around it. And I'm like... Now you've included a character who actually, as far as I understand, wouldn't have been there and wouldn't have had any part in this chronologically and family wise and connections wise. And yet they are now there and they are watching it from the outside from a different angle. And I've seen it already and I don't know what to do. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm slowly breaking down. So the thing with Psyche and Eros as well, it's like the, the original myth is what we have is from Roman like sources. Okay. So we have it from Apuleius. And he writes a bunch of these very, very famous stories that we know have Greek root. So this is one that has a Greek root. So taking the story and saying, how do I write this in a Greek root without a Greek source? I think everybody's like super signed up to seeing what she's going to do with that. But as a classics enthusiast, as a classicist myself, I'm looking at that going, great, you can set this anywhere, right? Like this is just Mm. a general story. So you can pick Corinth, you can pick... Uh, an island you could pick wherever it is like it's not Mm -hmm. specific in the roman sources we have no idea what would have been the specificity if there was any in the greek sources and she chose mycenae because there are a bunch of characters that people know but in order to set it in there she had to put it at a time period like you said like well does this actually match i mean it was it's a myth that's written on the side of other myths so actually it doesn't kind of really exist in the same timeline as any of the others so again you could have done it anywhere and I think that was the issue that I had was that in my head I'm thinking you could have done anything with this anywhere and I wouldn't be able to fact check that Mm, so you could have done something really interesting and yet you chose and I I don't mean this in a bad way because Luna McNamara is clearly so smart she knows her Trojan War mythology she knows her Medusa mythology She has, if you guys haven't seen her interview with Liv, she keeps up with Liv in the conversation. They have such an incredible discourse about mythology in general and about characters and crossovers and Greek and Roman stuff. She's so smart, but to me, this didn't make any sense. But I'm like, how did someone so smart manage to put this myth that had so much potential into a really boring timeline? Yeah, and especially a timeline that at this point, surely has been like bled dry that's what i we, mean by boring that's so like much. we know it yeah. like everyone's yeah. done it everyone knows the details unless yeah. you know it so well like you know costanza cassati like mm-hmm. reads all of the clytemnestra ancient greek sources over and over again she's like this is something that hasn't been done i'm gonna do this version or whatever unless you know it that well which you guys will know i've had costanza on she's a genius that is just very much centered in on Clytemnestra, unless you're going to go that much into it, then just pull it back. And this was a great opportunity to pull it back, make it really clean, really simple. I don't know who is at fault for that because I don't Mm. know if it was her or if it was like a publisher saying who's familiar. Yep. Yep. That's what I keep wondering. Is this an editor's choice to shoehorn this in? I keep using the word shoehorn because that's really how it felt. And I, I I have to apologize right now. We're we're digging into the th- that that bugged us, and I didn't plan to do that. Right, <laughs> this the idea to just tear apart this one specific scene, but it's clearly something that has niggled at both of us. And and especially you know you are a classicist. I am 
a, a person that likes to read books and that's very different but we're both being torn apart by this choice and it's very important to highlight that fact the fact that there is so much shoehorning and it's not just that choice but also as we said the idea of introducing certain characters because they are so famous and because they're recognizable like medusa like perseus and it's like so psyche and eros you said it could be set anywhere and it was set here not just at this specific time at this the most famous thing in all of of greek mythology the trojan war arguably and then also include other characters like perseus and medusa is there a sense that maybe like Luna thought that this is the narrative that everyone understands. This is the headcanon of all readers is that Greek mythology is these gods, these monsters, the Trojan War. Therefore, I've got to fit these new characters that most people, myself included, don't know into this narrative. And so it's got to fit. So I'm going to have her related to Perseus here and she's going to meet Medusa here and the Trojan War will happen here. And then she will fit in the jigsaw puzzle because that's how she assumes that readers think of it as this puzzle that she's got to fit into. I don't know. That's, that's, that's a way of making that make sense. And yeah, and I completely agree with that because there is also a thought process of not only people are also going to be familiar with these names, they're going to be able to ground it. But I think also with Greek mythology, there is no real like in the overall study of Greek mythology, there's no real timeline. Like we know the Trojan War timeline, but, and where that fits in. But a lot of the other myths, it's like, well, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's there. Sometimes they go from this place to this place. And sometimes that person meets that person. But in that mythology, that one was long dead, you know? So even though we go at it and you kind of have to go at it with like, these are the very basic guidelines. Like there is a sense of like murkiness around Mm. everything. So Again, as I was reading it, because I really did want to love it, I was also thinking about that. I was like, maybe it's just sort of coming in it as, you know, here are the the pinpoints that people know, as you said, characters that people don't know. And if I'm going to set this in a place that no one knows, at a time period that no one knows, with characters that no one knows, maybe people won't figure out that Greek mythology is actually really big. And so this does make sense in Greek mythology, but not in pop culture Greek mythology. I don't know if I explained that well. But... No, that's absolutely perfect. And and like, but she surely would be able to recognize that or maybe see an opportunity to to broaden people's horizons when it comes to the 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 breadth of Greek mythology. And what's weird is like I grew up really enjoying the concept of Greek mythology because of pop culture. Disney's Hercules is my favorite Disney animated film. Um, Zeus and Hera being happily married is weird, but apart from that, um, it has the greatest line in Disney history, which is when Hades walks in and says, I haven't seen this much love in a room since Narcissus discovered himself. It's the Iconic. Line in <laughs> Amazing. But that film is really underappreciated. So I remember watching that and watching the series and and learning who Icarus was and stuff like that. And then I played the God of War video games on PS2 when I was a teenager. And I'm slowly expanding my idea of what Greek mythology is based on cartoons, video games, films, whatever. The Trojan War, I wasn't that familiar with until all of these Greek mythology retellings start coming up and 90% of them are focused on that. But they don't have to be. And I f- I don't know where to come down. Like, if you think about Ariadne, Ariadne introduces characters, including Ariadne herself, that probably aren't that familiar to people. And it worked brilliantly. This could have been exactly that, but it wasn't. And I find that confusing. And Stoneblind as well. People know who Medusa is, but that's a whole very specific story. I don't know. I, I feel like the shoehorning element actually causes this book to get watered down, where it could have been strengthened by a more narrow focus on these characters, setting them aside from the thing that we're all getting a bit tired, or at least I assume we're all getting a bit tired of. I am. <laughs> I'm just yeah, gonna I mean, raise I, my hand in the corner yeah. here. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot 
I cannot again read Agamemnon sacrificing Iphigenia. Iphigenia? Iphigenia? How do you... I say Iphigenia, but okay. Okay. again, a Greek right. person. You guys know on my channel, I always say this and I really do mean it. Tell me in the comments because I say Iphigenia and no one's ever corrected me, but they correct yeah. me about everything else. Help us out. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pin the comment. I'm yeah, I have absolutely no idea. But if I have to watch him sacrifice his kid again, like I'm going to stop reading these almost always undeniably excellent books. And that's sad. So well, don't don't do that. Well, this is the thing that I think her writing is beautiful, right? Like, mm -hmm. and I don't want that to oh, go unnoted because I do think that she's so talented. Like the way she told the story, just the way that she even like writes dialogue. I love the way that she really got into the characters' voices. Like- I thought every one of them was so defined and so specific that even if she didn't have the name on the end of like a speech, I knew exactly who had said it. Like I knew if it was yeah. Zephyrus, I knew if it was Eros, I knew like, I think that she is so talented, but yeah. when it comes to shoehorning, I'm going to take that word from you. The, uh, the thing, like when I started the book, we opened with Atalanta. Yeah. We have Psyche show up for you guys who haven't had the book yet. This is not ruining it for you. This is like the first couple of pages that you have Psyche show up and in the original myth, she has this prophecy, but in the original myth, it's that she's going to marry a monster. And okay. this book changes it, which I loved that she's going to fight a monster. So the idea of being like, hey, if I'm going to change this to be much more female empowerment and all of this, which I was so on board with to bring in Atalanta, I was like, perfect. You've got a female warrior. When you read Atalanta, you'll see this yeah. character's a gem. She's amazing. Yeah. So the to female, bring her the in. The one female Argonaut is the idea, isn't she? Yes. she was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So she did a bunch of really cool things in ancient Greek mythology. Um, and having her come into it to train Psyche, I was like, brilliant. I love mm -hmm. this. I love a way of shoehorning in a character that because Jennifer Saint just wrote a book, I was like, you can sell these together as like yeah. complimentary. <laughs> I had that like, same thought. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To be like, oh, well, you can read Atalanta's story in Jennifer Saint, and then you can read her pop up in Psyche and Eros to sort of have a way of grounding you in that world, whilst mm -hmm. also then grounding you in Jason and the Argonauts. So it is yeah. still grounded in something that everyone's familiar with. But I just, I just felt like adding in the Trojan War stuff, I was like, we've done too much here. Whereas if you had picked one, and I would have preferred the Atalanta one, because I think that was done very, very well. And I loved yeah. her inclusion. I think that would have been the best way to go because it would have been new, fresh, tied in with Jennifer Saint, sold as a couple. They could have done like joint events together. You guys, I should be somebody's manager. What's happening? <laughs> I've just planned a whole press tour <laughs> for these two books. It is absolutely perfect. It's wild how that would have worked narratively and also in terms of actual publishing and marketing. That's insane. Absolute talent. Don't know what happened. Obviously, we don't know this book could have been written very slowly over the course of 10 years. I don't actually know. And that is often the case. So it's really hard to say that that would have worked and yet it would have worked. So the idea that you've got everything that you just mentioned, Atalanta training this young girl and then the, the Trojan War happens. And I'm like, we'd, we wouldn't even have to sacrifice length that much. In, just add other things instead put it somewhere else instead i i don't know i, don't I would know. have preferred and again like you said like we have no idea what the structure of this book is with regards to timeline of her writing like i know that with on liv's podcast i think i don't know if she started writing in the pandemic or if she had the idea during the pandemic so <laughs> it was sometime a few years ago when she at least thought of this idea and thought of doing it so okay we don't know the timeline but like if she had just kept with Atalanta and then instead of having the Trojan War referenced Jason and the Golden Fleece and used that as her sort of like pinpoint mm -hmm. to really like go into like, oh, Atalanta has to leave because she has to go on the Argo in order to do this thing. Then lots of people are going to go, oh, well, I know that. And I know Medea and I know this. And oh, yeah. my God, it would have also worked because Rosie Hewlett is about to release Medea. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm having like a publicity nightmare and I have never even done publicity. Stop. But it suddenly makes Psyche and Eros, which ultimately is a good book, feel like a missed opportunity. Like if it could have just been rewritten and published again six months later and had a whole different effect. I don't know how to feel now. 
This is really frightening. And that's the, that she is so talented and she knows her mythology. And I want to keep stressing that, like everything that she wrote in the book is accurate. Like it's fine with regards to the mythology. The idea that Psyche lives at Mycenae was lost on me. I don't know why she does that because it means that Agamemnon's evicted from his house. So that whole family is like a traveling, you know, like army I had to, family. I, I had to figure this out. I didn't, because even in the blurb, it phrases her not as a princess of Mycenae, but the princess. And I was like, no, I know, I, I'm i I'm a layman and I know this. This, no, but she's not though. And then I'm like, okay, so this is a hundred, 200 years before. She's the, surely Psyche is either the great, great, great grandmother of uh, Agamemnon or this is uh, because the timeline can be wibbly wobbly if it wants to be but no it's happening at the same how and I couldn't figure it out see that would have been an interesting take though as well if she had gone that route because I didn't even notice that that was in the blurb that my Sinean princess was in the blurb but like she literally says the print I looked at it earlier <laughs> uh print yeah Psyche princess princess of Mycenae yeah, see, like, what she could have done is set it, like you said, like, 200, 100 years beforehand or whatever, so that you set it in a place that's familiar. Like, yeah. oh, we know, like, that means that you'll have a touch point of, like, you know what's going to happen, even though you don't know, you know, yeah. a, a great amount of Greek mythology. It's, like, still you're, like, ah, ha, 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 later on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> later on, Agamemnon's coming, <laughs> and shit's yeah. going to happen here, but not right now, sort of a thing. Yeah. That could have been another way of basing it in that, because her dealing of the myth, minus so psyche in the myth has sisters okay but minus that which she can cut out because the sisters is a bit of a weird tangent in the original story so like yeah fine cut them out that's totally fine but the actual myth of psyche and eros their relationship what happens there that's bang on okay so Good. the way she handled that and that was the issue for me that when i read it i was like this is so this is it though like you've done it you've then just put all of this fluff around it that it mm. didn't need because it's such a compelling story anyways, the two mm. of them. Yeah. And it's such like an odd story to wrap your head around. Like all of this has to happen in the dark. She can't see him. Okay, this is really odd. And like, are they going to fall in love? Are they actually in love? Like, is this, now I'm worried about consent. Like all of those things are sort of going into. Yeah, that. So it is really interesting in yeah. of itself. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like you've got the titular characters and their love affair. And that is all solid and pretty captivating and I think handled with a lot of sort of um there's a lot of ups and downs there's murkiness there's drama there is will they won't they there is, there's a lot of I would say um dynamism in the romance and not just romance but the relationship in general because it's not just a romance there is there are in so many great love stories there are elements of distrust and hatred and heartbreak and friendship and reunion and all these it's all pretty much in there and i think it's handled really well and so you can be someone who knows nothing about greek mythology but you like romance and you could read this exactly. that that would be great that would be awesome and romance set during wartime is kind of a beautiful thing this is that as well so i feel like this would be better read by people who love romance rather than people who love Greek mythology. That would be a better angle to come into this book from. That's a really good point, actually. So just more so like recommend it that way, as opposed yeah. to like, oh, we love Greek mythology. Come read this because it's Psyche and Eros. Yeah, Because I think the issue is that like so many people who know Psyche and Eros were so excited. Like they were like, oh, this story is finally, you know, getting rewritten. Like that's how everybody way back when Jennifer Saint released Ariadne, like the little small corner of the internet that were nerds and knew Ariadne were like, Fuck yes, someone's writing Ariadne. We're getting this yeah. story. Like I'm so excited kind of a thing. And that's how everyone felt about this. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like, you know, missed opportunity with the mythology. But I guess if you don't go into it with that and you're just like, I love a good romance. I love drama. You know, I want the deceit and the distrust and all of that sort of uh, stuff in it. Then you yeah. do, you're right. Yeah. You get all of those things yeah. in this book. Yeah, this is really your ideal thing for people who love romance above all else. And they want good drama and they want sex and they want betrayal and they want people who hate each other and love each other all at the same time. It's all in there. And I, I, I love I love that idea that it could just be marketed as an intensely powerful romance set at a time of Greek mythology that might also work as a kind of gateway 
for people who love romance to go, oh, hang on, this Medusa character is interesting. Well, luckily you've got Stone Blind and then you move on from there. Uh, but the thing is, the Eros side of it as well, I generally really enjoyed. I like, I actually, no, I more, I really, really, really enjoyed the first, I don't know how long it goes on for. Let's say the first act of the book um, is them to Psyche and Eros completely divided and you're exploring the world of humans from her perspective and gods from his and through his you get the creation myth and you get a lot of info about Gaia and you learn a new <laughs> the new angle of um Iphigenia's sacrifice was not a new angle but the new angle of the creation myths around Gaia and the titans and the gods all that that felt different. That felt like, I know that creation myth. I love the gods and the titans, and I love the story of Kronos and Zeus. That's all great. This actually felt different, and I felt like I was learning it for the first time. That was cool as hell. I really enjoyed it. I don't, again, don't know how many liberties she's took. She's taken. She took. She took. Grammar. But... <laughs> But I enjoyed it nonetheless. And I think quite often when it comes to taking liberties, it's fine if it's fun. And it was fun. That's and I think stuff. as well, another fun character to highlight is Zephyrus. I thought he was done really well. That's a genuine wind in Greek mythology. And I yeah. liked that someone took like a character as a best friend that we haven't seen before. You know, because yeah. I feel like people always go for the, you know, really well-known ones or like Hermes will some way somehow end up being the best friend or so you know it's always the person that we are familiar with and instead she gave us Zephyrus which I was really excited by when mm -hmm. he first of all popped up and like his references of some of his stories I was like oh those are really cute like I loved those yeah and I he, he felt very beautifully distrustful when it came to his private conversations he had with Psyche and it was like okay, we do know kind of what you're up to because we see the Eros stuff and we see his chats with Eros. But at the same time, I kept thinking, trust. Where is the trust? How much do I trust? What is going to happen? What twists and turns might come up with regards to what he's plotting and planning and the way he's building his relationship with these characters? Really engaging stuff. Really engaging. Love that. And, and I he's think a well... I don't know either. Oh, he's one you didn't know beforehand? No. Oh. I know. So you learned someone new. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I did. I actually did. Yeah. How wonderfully exciting. I know, because as far as I could tell from this book, there are several wind gods, and I didn't even know that. So he's like the god of the west wind or something. Yeah, there are lots I, of them. When you yeah, read I, like Homer, you'll meet all of them, and you're like, who does what? Why are they having a dinner party? What's going on? Cool. So the, all of that stuff, I think the gods in particular were handled really well, and like circling all the way back to Medusa when she suddenly appeared her narrative voice was like you said all the characters have strong narrative voices very clear-cut personalities that you're not going to mix and get confused and I think that was true for her although she's arguably an intensely aggressively feminist mouthpiece uh, who is just sort of almost you could almost picture her standing behind a podium giving a lecture on the difference between um, the idea of a monster from a patriarchal perspective and what a monster really is and whether there is such a thing as a monster. And Stoneblind did that across a whole other novel without ever making clear statements, doing it through allegory, doing it through metaphor, doing it through a narrative rather than just the, mon the monster herself standing there and going, I'm not a monster, here's my TED talk. But at the same time, I liked her narrative. I still liked her voice. So... It was it was cool. I just I did think it was weird that she was there as kind of a tour guide. See, I thought it was very strange that she was included. But then when I realized, like, well, this is the family line that Lunas decided to throw Psyche into. It was kind of inevitable that we were going to get her. But I yeah. felt the same way about her, because for me, when you set up Psyche as a warrior and you include Atalanta as a warrior, I'm like, we're doing all the feminism. Like, we got this shit. You know, we've got these two women who are literally one is a trained fighter and one is a fighter in training. The yeah. idea is that they are carrying the story. They are the ones who are in the power. Like they have all the autonomy, which is really, it was so wonderful to see. And I loved that, but I didn't feel like we needed Medusa to say it. Yes. Cause I was like, you're showing me already. Like it wasn't like she didn't include those characters. Those characters were there. And then yeah. we also got, you know, like female rage on the other end of it. So we got Aphrodite, an incredibly yeah. powerful female yeah. character 
who's horrible and evil. Yeah. So we got all the spectrums of really yeah, wonderful right. feminism in there. But I just yeah. felt like the Medusa being thrown in there was like, I just want to make sure that this is clear. And I was like, yes. no, 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 we got it. We got it. Yeah. That's exactly it's like it's like maybe Luna didn't have like full trust in the reader to understand the feminism that was going on. So let's have Medusa explain it. And I was like, I used to be a high school English teacher. And there was always this phrase that you would use, which is show, don't tell, you know, show the character's feelings, don't explain what they're feeling. Right. Um, the character frowned rather than the character was angry. And that's exactly what happens here is that you get sh everything you just said, you get shown all of this feminine rage, um, feminine empowerment, and then Medusa going, and here's what feminism is. And you're like, no, I, I, no, I got it. I, I <laughs> get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I f that's why I felt like when I met her, I was like, okay, it makes sense. I don't know why she's here, but it makes sense. And then the more that she spoke, I was like, if you were going to have her, this wasn't necessary. Like, yeah. I understand that she actually... I guess with the story that was being told, like it does also make sense, even if Perseus wasn't part of the family tree to have her being the guide. Cause I'm like, I mean, why not? Everyone knows her. Like it would be a fine person to have sort of guide you through the underworld to be like, by the way, like here's some things you should probably worry about up in the real world. It's a horrible place. But it just, it for me, it seems like maybe it could have been more natural, but it wasn't as natural as I had hoped when I first saw her name. Yeah. Despite yeah. her character, as you said, being clear, despite her voice being really powerful and very unique. And I was like, good. I'm I'm glad that she's here and I'm glad that she's your version. But if you cut that scene, it wouldn't have impacted the rest of the book. Not at all. No, you're right. You're right. Not at all. Absolutely. Yeah. And like cutting back is kind of a beautiful thing and cutting out the fluff, things that don't need to be there, cut the fat. That is, yeah, but at the same time, because I enjoyed her and I enjoyed her voice, it would be a shame not to have it. It's it's actually quite a conflicting thing in that way. It's like, I didn't regret reading her passages because they were good, but at the same time, what did they add? It's kind of, it would be a really hard choice to make when you realize that it is in fact kind of wasted space, but it's space you enjoy. Ah, <laughs> it's a weird, it's a weird thing. And I also like, now that we're talking about the feminism aspect, one thing that I, you know, Clytemnestra is like my favorite of all of these books. The one thing I really liked about her is how dynamic she was as a character, especially a, a female character with agency who is in a very patriarchal society, a man's world, having to survive and go through so much tragedy and trauma, blah, blah, blah. And she does survive and she she is twisted out by it really badly. The idea of your protagonist in what is ostensibly a romance being trained to be a fighter by the one badass female character, it is a bit weird, the idea that feminism is like when, when women can stand up in a man's world. Feminism is when you turn your woman into something like a man. I, I can't quite phrase it right, but I don't know if I like the idea that what McNamara seemed to be saying was that feminism is when a woman acts like a man mm. and performs the masculine version of strength that's probably the best way to put it is that training her to be a fighter is turning her into a masculine thing rather than feminine strength existing on its own right which i think it does in clytemnestra and ariadne ariadne as well is strong in her own right as a woman rather than having to be strong in a masculine way that's a really interesting point I didn't even think about, actually. Honestly, this is this is new to me as well. I've just realized this, that strength doesn't have to be masculine strength. That's what I'm saying. Well, it's I'm, it's funny just because I'm thinking about the ancient sources. So you're right, like, when it comes to Ariadne, like, she's smart in her own way and then, yeah. you know, ends up with Dionysus and all this. So it all works out in the end. Even and I love smart. Dionysus. He's, he's <laughs> my, my best boy. He's a beautiful boy. I love him. And there are some really good examples of feminine strength as well in like Penelope from the Odyssey, who's yeah. someone that doesn't fight, but tricks all of them, mm. you know, and is always described as being just as smart as Odysseus, but in totally different ways. Yeah. But when I think of a lot of these female characters from the ancient world, when you read the ancient source material, masculine words are used to describe the women that they don't like. So it's because they're too masculine. Oh, so Clytemnestra 
in ancient source material is described using masculine language because the idea is that she's acting like a man rather than a woman. Whereas Penelope, mm, that, who's strong, yeah. she's used feminine characters, feminine character, feminine words even yeah. to describe her. So both strong characters, but the ones that they condemn are for their masculine qualities. Oh, that's so interesting. I mean, that's that happens now, right? Like, um, like even today, when and a lot of it is very um sort of drenched in homophobia as well. The idea of calling a lesbian butch because she's too man mannish is another one. And there's uh not feminine enough, therefore looking masculine, therefore not the idealized version of femininity, blah, blah, blah. So that that's something that unfortunately is still going on. Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, wow, okay. Yeah. So back to this, the idea that Psyche, her strength comes from being trained to stand up in a masculine world. Ultimately, I don't know where to come down on it. At first, when I when I first when the point popped into my head, I was like, I have a great point here to say about how this is actually not feminist at all. And then you said everything you said, and now I'm back to going, I don't know. I sure. think it's one of those gray areas. I wonder what everybody else, if you guys are listening and like have your own opinions, like let us know in the comments. Like I'd be interested to see if anyone based off of that conversation would say this is more yeah. feminism or this is actually, I don't yeah. want to say going backwards because it's not going backwards at all, but it's just kind of doing the opposite of feminism of saying, well, women should be more like yeah. men rather than women should be more like women. And yeah. like, and yeah. being a woman is whatever it is that you want to be kind of a thing. Yeah. Feminine strength. What is that? Right. And an exploration yeah. into that. Yeah. Like a TED talk that's just called feminine strength. <laughs> What's all that about? Let's get Medusa <laughs> to say it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get her podium back out. And, uh, I don't really have any sort of final thoughts other than thanks to this conversation, the book has risen in in, in my opinion of it. I've gone from going this was a book that I enjoyed well enough to this is a book that has encouraged me to think a lot more carefully and sort of, um, I, I wanted to say intimately, I don't know if that's the right word. I'm just going to say carefully about, about the role of the woman and feminism and femininity and strength and all of those things within the context of Greek mythology. And given the fact that this is primarily a romance, I think that's a really cool thing. That's actually a really lovely place to end the video, unfortunately, <laughs> because I do have a response to that, but I just like that like landing note. And given the time, it's probably about time that we start wrapping things up anyway. So Willow, thank you. I mean, it goes without saying, thank you so much for joining me today on the channel. I hugely appreciate that you would take any time out of your entire year, no joke, your entire year to sit down and to chat with me because um, I'm such a fangirl. Um, so I really, really do appreciate it. And it goes without saying, you guys who are watching this at home, that you guys can find, as I said at the start of the video, all of Willow's links in the description below so that you guys can go and check out their account and also you know their other social medias as well as the blog if you guys want anything else that is not ancient history related that is not greek mythology related uh, you want other book reviews from a trusted person definitely go and check out willow's socials so thank you guys so much for watching and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on moan inc so i'll see you guys then Bye.